author to our first author book book talk. We're grateful all of you have joined us. Um, so far, we have about 90 uh, people on the call, and um, we are honored that you saw fit to spend your Wednesday evening with us to hear more about this incredible book and this important topic. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed speaker and author, Professor Kristen Henning. Kristen Henning is the Bloom Professor of Law and Director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative at Georgetown Law where she and her law students represent youth accused of delinquency in Washington, DC. She goes by Chris. Chris was previously the lead attorney for the juvenile unit of the DC Public Defender Service and is currently the director of the Mid-Atlantic Juvenile Defender Center. Chris has trained state actors across the country on the impact of racial justice in the juvenile in criminal legal system. Her workshops help stakeholders recognize their own biases and develop strategies to counter it. Chris also worked closely with the MacArthur Foundation's Juvenile Indigent Defense Action Network to develop a 41 volume juvenile training immersion program or JTIP, which is a national training curriculum for juvenile defenders. She now co-hosts with the National Juvenile Defender Center an annual week-long JTIP Summer Academy for trial lawyers and a series of trained trainer programs for experienced defenders. In 2019, Chris partnered with the NJDC to launch a racial justice toolkit for youth and advocates, for youth advocates. And again in 2020, to launch the Ambassadors for Racial Justice program, a year long program for juvenile defenders committed to challenging racial injustice in the juvenile legal system through litigation and systemic reform. Chris writes extensively about race, adolescence and policing. Her new book, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth, has already received rave reviews in the New York Times Book Review and the Washington Post. Professor Henning serves on the board of directors for the Center for Children's Law and Policy, the American Bar Association's Juvenile Justice Standards Task Force, and the ALI's Restatement on Children and the Law Project. She has won several awards, including the Juvenile Leadership Prize by the Juvenile Law Center and the Robert E. Shepard Jr. Award for Excellence in Juvenile Defense by the National Juvenile Defender Center. We are so honored and so thrilled to have you here with us tonight, Professor Henning. Thank you for spending this time with us. Yes, thank you so much, Simone. I'm happy to be here uh, with so many of you on this evening, so thank you. So I'm gonna start with the burning question. What inspired you to write this book? Yeah, great way to start. I'm gonna tell you, um, as you indicated, I have been representing children in uh, the nation's capital for the last 26 years. And in that entire time, I have only represented four white children. We should all pause and gasp wow. at that number. Four white children in 26 years. The wow. entire rest of my caseload has been um, Black children. Um, and so that would lead many of you to believe either that there are no white children in the nation's capital or that white children don't commit crimes. Right. And uh, we know that neither of those are true. Uh, it used to be <laughs> that uh, the nation's capital was known as Chocolate City, but it has evolved so much. Um, and uh, there are absolutely you know, plenty of white children in, in the city. Um, and so it, it's really hard to do the work 
for that long and not want to, to be quite frank, blow up the whole juvenile legal system. Um, but short of that, what I wanted to do with this book is, is really to answer some critical questions. One of which is, um, are these racial disparities evident all across the country? And the answer is absolutely yes, um, which is one of the reasons that I know you invited me here to talk um, in, in Arlington County. So the, 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 the disparities are evident all over the country. I wanted to know why these extreme disparities exist. I wanted to know, and this is really important, I really wanted to know how these racial disparities were affecting uh, Black children in particular, mentally, physically, psychologically, developmentally, such a critical question. And I also wanted to know the burning question on everyone's mind is, whether or not this disparate or these racial disparities and uh, in both the policing and in the criminalization of, of black children was making America any safer. In other words, you know, if we lock all the kids, black and brown kids up, you know, are we all safer? Um, and you know what my answer is going to be before. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And then I wanted to know, you know, if, if, it, if it is true that these racial disparities are not justified by by making us any safer, they're not helpful, um, and maybe even harmful, then what should we be doing about it? And so that's, that's was what motivated me to, to really get this on paper. I am so glad you, you said that, that these issues are happening all across the country. Because something that we've heard in Arlington time and time again from our leaders our school board members, our county board members, and our law enforcement officials is that doesn't happen here. Right. It's like an Arlington mantra. Yes, we know there are racial disparities in the juvenile justice system. We know that the school to prison pipeline is real, but that doesn't happen in Arlington. So I'm so glad that you said that you've seen from your work and you're, st and you're studying this issue, it happens all across the country. Yeah. And I know your data bears it out in Arlington, you know, yes. the, the, the disparate arrest of, of African-American children um, in relationship to your population. I, if you are, you to please correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, they're like, you know, 35, that, that the arrest of children in Arlington are, um, black children account for 35.9% of all of those arrests, although they make up only what, about nine, 10%? That's absolutely right. Yeah. And we're going to share that data with the audience um, towards the end. But yes, we, we've raised that issue. Uh, the NAACP has talked about that um, at length. And the response we get back from our police department is, well, those, are, those children don't all live here. Uh, Most of those kids are from D.C. <laughs> They're not Arlington kids, but it doesn't matter. It right. doesn't matter. The bias is the same. Correct. And the issues are the same. Yeah. So the answers to the questions that I list that I wanted to grapple with, why does it occur? You know, what kind of harms and impacts does it have? All of that is the same, regardless of whether the child crossed, you know, the, the, the state border from uh, Washington, D.C. That's right. Virginia. So I've read the book um, twice. Well, you know, I listened to it on audio and, you know, flipped through it myself. And I listened to it also with my 16 year old son. Mm. Um, and, you know, what is unique about your book that, that I haven't seen in a lot of other books that I've read recently is it's not just an academic text. Mm -hmm. but it weaves together nicely the stories of the real life cases, the, the stories of the, what we hear in the news as well. And also it bridges that with the research, um, lots of data and research um, to make your point. Yeah. Um, why did you choose that approach? So I was very intentional about that, both, you know, on my own uh, desire, but also just, you know, advice from so many people as we think about and grapple with the hard questions. I think all of us out there recognizes that 
um, everyone will come to this question or come to this um, issue of racial disparities from a different lens. And for some people, the your hearts and minds will be changed by the stories. In other words, I desperately wanted readers to see themselves in these stories, to see their own childhood in oh. these stories. Or if you have children, I wanted you to be able to see your own children in these stories and immediately say, I would never treat my own child like this, or, um, you know, you know you know, forgive me if, <laughs> I can only imagine if I um, had been treated the way many of my clients, you know, had been treated um, in response to mistakes that we have all made when we were adolescents. So I really, you know, that was really important to me. Another thing that was really important to me about stories was um, we can't get people to read uh, the research and the data um, all the time. This is absolutely a mass press book, a trade press book meant for um, an average reader, including, I love that you said your 16 year old uh, was listening with you. I have been just absolutely, um, um, uh, you know, blessed and excited to see the number of young people who have gravitated towards this book, boys and girls clubs, um, classes, you know, social yeah. studies classes, history classes. Pe the, the students have said repeatedly, I see myself, I, this is my experience. You have given voice to my experience through this book. And that has really been extraordinarily important to me because as you said, Simone, in the book, I tell stories from my clients, right? My client right. experiences, right. as yeah. well as um, those drawing uh, some details from the high profile, some of the high profile stories that we all know about, Tamir Rice, um, Eric Garner, um, right. Mike Brown. But what I really wanted to do was to make sure that we don't think those high profile cases are outliers, the extreme Absolutely. example. And so I really wanted to draw in um, my cases as well from DC, average children, yes. Yes. right? Um, yeah. Black and brown children who are criminalized. So that was the point, that was the goal with the stories. And then as you indicated, I included data and um, research because there are others of you, maybe even who are listening today and certainly who, um, who I talk to, who will say, okay, okay, you know, um, I appreciate your anecdotal account, but what do the numbers say? What does the empirical research say? And so what I wanted to do was to weave that all together Together. So whatever you need, <laughs> right, yeah. whatever yeah. you need to believe <laughs> that Black and Brown children are being criminalized uh, today, um, I wanted to give that to you um, in, in the various forms. And I wanted to do so in a way that was accessible, easy to read, and easy to digest for yeah. an average reader. Um, and so that was, that's, that's sort of the goal and the approach of this. And you did, you hit it on the head. You did a phenomenal job with that because, you know, as I'm listening with my son, you know, these stories about Tamir Rice and Michael Brown and, and, and all these stories in the news, it's sort of abstract right. for him, right? He's like, oh, wow, you know, it's something happening out there. But the way that you have told these stories, it's so relatable to him. Like he sees himself in, in this. He sees his classmates in these stories. And I see my child in, in this story, in, yes. in, 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 in these stories of my children, you know, and I'm not gonna lie, it's a little heavy. It it's is a little heavy. heavy. It's it heavy, heavy for me. It's heavy, it was for him, it was heavier for me. I mean, I I, I just couldn't get through it without crying <laughs> a few times. But absolutely we I feel like we owe it to these victims to hear and know their stories and understand why they ended up in the system that they did or, 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 or learn from how they were treated so that we, we can make change. And the data and the research really um, is a great balance. It's not just all quote unquote pain porn. It's 
facts mm -hmm. and data mm -hmm. and the research that really weaves the understanding together of why this is happening, how exactly um, our, our, our Black children are being criminalized um, uh, yeah. in, in, in this country. And I'll, I'll so, just add, before we yeah. get to the next question, just that in, in a way that a number of the young people who've read the book have talked about it as almost cathartic, as healing, as a way yeah. to surface. And, you know, we'll talk later about, you know, solutions or, uh, you know, I don't know, solutions is ever the right word, but the, um, you know, how we move forward. And I plug that right now, but it's yeah. figuring out how to have this conversation with young people so that they can share their stories. Right? Absolutely. So I'll stop there. Yeah. No, yes, absolutely. And so, you know, you know, in the NAACP, we we one of our our missions and especially in the education committee is to look at disparities and discrimination in how black children are, you know, are impacted in our public schools. And nothing really illustrated this for me. I know that ex disparities exist, right? I'm a black woman, a black mother of a black child, and in, 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 I'm black in America. I know disparities exist, but nothing was as stark and uh, poignant as an illustration for me as the story of Eric mm -hmm. with the Molotov cocktail. Can you tell us about Eric and what messages we should draw from that story? Yes, for sure. So Eric is the story that I actually opened the book with. Um, and Eric it was indeed a client of mine. And at the time he was 13 years old. So he's a 13 year old boy who on a Saturday night is at home watching a movie. And in the movie, um, he sees someone making a Molotov cocktail. And in his 13 year old brain, he says, ooh, that looks cool. Let me see if I can make something that looks like that. So he goes into his kitchen, he grabs a glass bottle and he begins to pour liquid in the bottle. Now, mind you, he's not researching it. He's just pouring liquids into the bottle, bleach, pine saw, whatever he can find in the kitchen. And then he tapes up the bottle so that it looks like, you know, this Molotov cocktail. And this is my favorite part of the story. In his very 13 year old way, he grabs a piece of toilet paper and runs the toilet paper from the inside of the bottle to the outside. And he puts the cap on it, right? Now we all know that that uh, toilet paper is going to burn out before it even reaches the cap. So it's never going to be a Molotov cocktail, nor were the liquids in it ever going to be a Molotov cocktail. So, you know, he plays with his, his little toy. He then puts it in his book bag um, so that it doesn't spill out on his mother's uh, white carpet. I've been there, I've seen the white carpet, literally he puts it in his book bag on a Saturday night and he forgets about it. Monday morning comes, he uh, grabs his book bag and his mother drives him to school. He enters the school, puts his book bag on the conveyor belt for the metal detector and goes in. A school resource officer sees the, the bottle inside uh, the bag and says, what is this? Um, Eric immediately says, oh, that's nothing. You can throw it away. And he grabs his bag and goes on to class, not thinking anything uh, else about it. Little does he know, this is the beginning of a nine month ordeal in juvenile court. They, uh, police officers show up, the fire department shows up, they drag him out of class, they arrest him, you know, escort him through the school in front of all of, you know, his friends and classmates. And he tried to tell them, I'm not trying to blow up the school. What are you talking about? Like, this is crazy. He was never given the benefit of the doubt. And so you ask me what the variety, I mean, there's so many themes, right? I mean, this book, I mean, this uh, story was a wonderful way to start this book um, because of all the themes that it gathers, right? It is the, um, the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors. This is a child who is being creative, right? He's not being right, violent. Right. He's not being a mass murderer, right? But yet we are just, um, you know, I wanted, I, well, let me say a couple of things. One, um, another thing is that that the immediate default to a law enforcement response 
instead of an alternative response, right? The fact that no one stopped to think about the collateral consequences of criminalizing this creativity. So for him, I should tell you about him, he was very active in drama. Um, and he was immediately expelled from all of his drama uh, classes. He actually was suspended from school. The suspension turned into an expulsion until we uh, worked with some special education attorneys um, to get him back um, into school. But even when he came back to school, he was not allowed to return to, to his drama classes. Um, and so really the message that was sent was that this is not, that school is not a safe place to be, all right? right? But here's the story, here's the race piece of this, okay? So um, so I represent Eric, right? Yeah. And um, I think the story is just unbelievable. Um, I'm sad about it. But then I go to a conference in Connecticut, oh. conference on uh, youth justice issues. And I am giving a talk and I share this story in the talk. Someone comes up to me, a white woman comes up to me and she says, my son did the exact same thing at his school. And I said to her, well, what happened to him? And she said, they put him in advanced science classes to cater mm -hmm. to his creativity um, and his intellect and his interest. And so I really, that story was for me, that was a life-changing moment. And I, like I said, and Simone said, I've been representing children for 26 years. Um, and now this is a few years ago at this point, but it was then, right? When that yeah. happened, that my whole world you know, woke up because in Washington DC with the stark racial disparities, it makes me think, well, maybe, you know, you know, you become complicit almost in mm -hmm. thinking number mm -hmm. one, that, you know, um, that only black kids are committing crimes and that this is an appropriate response to that kind of behavior, right. race is not. I mean, there is no, you know, just thinking about um, uh, about the situation and the contrast in how we respond says so much about bias. Um, it, you Absolutely, know, and bias, right? And bias is is truly, you know, people say I don't want to talk about implicit bias. Bias is so implicit you can live, you know, with uh, with this idea that it was appropriate um, to arrest Eric. Right, and think right. that it's completely fine. Go on for years thinking right. it's completely fine. You bring them to school. Of That's course, it. they're going to get consequences, right? Right. But it hit me between the eyes. It really yeah. hit me between the eyes when you said that. You know, when you learned of that white student in Connecticut, who the school's response to that student was to put him in advanced science class because of the lens at which they viewed viewed it there or with that child, right? There was no criminality um, attributed to him and they put him in advanced science class. And, I, and I'm like, if we could just take that approach to dealing with some of the behaviors of our kids, some of our kids are just not identified as gifted and they are, right? Yeah, absolutely. If we could take an academic approach and say, how can we channel this into something constructive, but that disparity right there just, it, it, blew, it blew my mind. It blew and, my and mind. I, right, and the other piece of that is the, the really understanding the, the unwillingness to give him a benefit of, of the, the doubt. doubt. That is huge. Yeah. And I, you know, yeah. I, there may come a time where we talk tonight about um, the differential outcome between Cal Rittenhouse, who was given due process, who was allowed to tell his story, who was allowed um, to demonstrate, you know, that he was a child who got in over his head and, you know, ultimately had to, you know, defend himself, whereas mm -hmm. Tamir Rice is never given that benefit of the doubt. Never. So many Black and Brown children are never given that benefit of the doubt um, uh, at, at right. all. And so right. I just wanted to note that. Yes, it, it, that's, that's what's painful to, you know, I, you know, it, it, it's painful. It's, it's heavy. <laughs> it's, it's heavy. Um, so in the book, you use the words criminalization and dehumanization uh, quite a bit. What does criminalization and dehumanization of black and brown youth look like in our country? 
Yeah, so I, I think, you know, it's best to think about the criminalization and dehumanization in three big buckets. Um, and I try to do that throughout the book. I think the first big bucket is, is what we just started with. Mm -hmm, it is mm -hmm. the criminalization of normal adolescent behavior, mm -hmm. behaviors. It is the yeah. criminalization. It is a law enforcement response to those things that all children do, not just in the United States, but all over the world. There is empirical mm -hmm. studies demonstrating that children of all races, all classes, all ethnicities um, exhibit the same key features of adolescence, impulsivity, um, sensation seeking, risk taking, poor judgment, right? They, um, this, this discussion about uh, children um, and peer influence is not a myth. It is empirically demonstrated that children do what their friends do or what they think their friends, the friends do, doing, yeah. right? And what they think their friends want them to do, right? So, you know, they're poor strategic thinkers. They're interested in the immediate rewards and and, and forget about the long-term consequences. So, um, and, and so what we see is the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors by black and brown children. And that's everything from uh, uh, talking back to teachers, talking back to police officers in ways that technically might be labeled a threat. But if we read the research, it's adolescent aggressive speech. How many of you um, as a parent have had a yep. kid, I hate you, you know, like I'm gonna beat you up. Like how many of them really mean that? Like, right, um, right. you know, so those kinds of criminalizing normal adolescent behaviors. And I don't know, you know, the entire makeup of this audience, but, you know, and I'm not just talking about uh, the criminalization of like formal, which is most of what I'm talking about, of, you know, formal arrest of a child like Eric. Um, but I'm also talking about school discipline. I'm also right. talking about like um, violations of probation and um, other ways in which we criminalize those normal adolescent behaviors um, uh, among children. And everything from, you know, sagging pants to the music uh -huh. that they listen to, rap music is perceived to be, you know, dangerous or thuggish music. Well, there is empirical research looking at country music, heavy metal, punk, rock music, all of which have the same sort of um, obscene, violent, um, sexist uh, language in it. And we don't criminalize that. And so I'm really I'm just begging us to see the ways in which we just don't respond um, to white children in the ways in which we respond to black children. So that's one whole bucket. The second yeah. bucket, which I know we'll spend some time on, is the hyper surveillance and mm -hmm. over policing of black and brown children. All right. And so here I am talking, uh, I want also want to be clear when I talk about over policing, I'm not just talking about policing by people in a blue uh, uniform, but right. also uh, by um, uh, all of us, right, who are complicit. We police by proxy, right? Absolutely. Um, Especially in schools by, you know, our administration, our, our administrators. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, I want to say, you know, this other piece about policing by law enforcement, what we're seeing and what I really try to demonstrate in those stories and in the research, right, in the data is that black and brown children now have grown up generations now of black and brown children have grown up with um, under the constant surveillance of police officers. I have clients who tell me that they walk out, they look out their window or they walk out of their apartments and they see police officers, you know, on the street corner, standing at the convenience store, you know, when they enter school, when they come out of school, um, just police officers constantly. Um, and it's, it's, it's like you live in a police state. So for those of you who have traveled to foreign countries, I have where I have really seen what it's like to live in a police state I'm like blown away like yeah, it's yeah. like going to certain neighborhoods in um in just pockets right so I imagine you have to stop and think what are the pockets in Arlington County you can't and for those of us who don't live in those pockets what it would be like to walk out every day and see a police officer right um and I can go a week and not that's see right. a police officer that I'm not looking for so that's that's, right. that's a piece right and then there is the 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 third layer is the dehumanizing responses when there is actual crime, right? So right, I've been talking right. about 
right? And, you know, so I talk about the criminalization of adolescent behaviors that shouldn't be criminalized. We should right. be shrinking the size of our juvenile court. But then there are kids who have engaged in criminal behavior. And so the mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. becomes, what is our response? How do we still continue to treat them with humanity? So I gave you sort of this um, negative list, <laughs> if you will, of all the key features of adolescence. Well, there's also yeah. the positive features of adolescence, which is resilience, right? The yes. number one feature is resilience and amenability to rehabilitation. And we are willing to have grace and compassion and tolerance for, for white children who commit crimes, uh, right. AKA uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, right? right. Um, right. But we have none of that grace or, um, you know, I, you know, it's hard for me to come up with this. Tamir Rice, we wasn't committing a crime. Khalif Browder, there's plenty of evidence. Oh, Khalif, right. He wasn't committing right. a crime. So many of the kids who, you know, are the high profile cases actually didn't commit, you know, crimes. My client, right. Eric, I would never have labeled that as a criminal conduct, right? Right, um, right. But, you know, let's say the kids who have guns, Right. Or the kids who have um, really engaged in uh, or have uh, have engaged in behavior that led to serious outcomes. Right. The question is, how do we respond with humanity, right. with rehabilitation? Um, and I, the last thing I want to say before, you know, I know you have more questions is I really want to drive home this point about serious violent offenses. So yeah. many of the things that indeed um, uh, have serious and violent outcomes right. start from some impulsive, reactive, poorly thought out, or I should say not thought out at all, adolescent behavior. And so I'm right. going to call to mind an example. Some of you may remember there was a white um, uh, girl, 18 years old, out of the state of Washington. She and a group of friends were at the top of a 60-foot bridge, right? They're laughing, they're talking, and right. Right. the 18-year-old sort of dares her friend, you know, hey, jump, jump. And then she's yeah. like, oh, nervous. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And so the 18-year-old pushes her 16-year-old friend off the bridge. Okay. What are the outcomes? I mean, she's got like, you know, fractured neck and bones, almost dies. Um, and, you know, the point is here, people treated her with grace. I'm going to yeah. say this one last time, and I promise you, I'm going to stop talking about Kyle Rittenhouse. Let me just explain <laughs> it. Kyle Rittenhouse engaged in the, his behavior was the absolute epitome of adolescent behavior at the outset. Here we have a 17-year-old boy who crosses state lines with an assault rifle um, on his, uh, across his uh, body, uh, walking through for extended period of time for all to see. In his 17-year-old mind, he thinks somehow he is competent with his very minimal experience. Right, he right. He is competent to go to this other, you know, city and uh, protect businesses that somehow need his 17-year-old help in the middle of a Black Lives Matter pro protest. All right. It's the absolute impulsive, you know, maybe it isn't even impulsive, but he's doing what his friends wanted him to do. Right. His friends. Quintessential all, adolescent behavior. At quintessential adolescence, not thought out, um, you know, just poor decision making. And people saw him with grace and forgiveness. And ultimately, what was the worst outcome possible? He kills two people and severely injures another. And yet folks managed to see his adolescence. I think that story right. is so critical when we think about children, um, black and brown children who have guns, you know, and the people wanna argue with well, the differences, they didn't have a license. And do we think that the license right. that, uh, the little hunting license that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse gave him license and permission to carry a weapon in public at a protest? Right. Absolutely not. So right. I just say, you all, we have to be honest. We have to be honest, okay, about um, how we respond, even in the most serious violent offenses. It's different for black and brown children than for white children. So I'm sorry, I'm getting a little worked up. No, 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 you're here. This is what, this is why you're here. Yeah. No apologies necessary. Um, you know, you, you touched on the resiliency and children are resilient. Black children are resilient 
and they're resilient by necessity, right? We have to be. I mean, <laughs> but at the same time, I, while we can acknowledge that resiliency, I, I don't want that to diminish yes. the impact of the trauma. Yes. Can, can you talk to me about the trauma yes. associated with policing our adolescents? All right, absolutely. And you know, for those of you who are saying, well, I don't need the stories, I wanna hear the research. Let me give you the research first, right? Um, and that is that there is a growing body of research documenting the extraordinary psychological trauma that policing, and again, policing by law enforcement and policing by the rest of us, that policing imposes on black and brown children at one of the most important times in their lives, their adolescent years. The studies show that black youth who have been the target of um, stops and frisk by the police report high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, they become hypervigilant, meaning that uh, they're always on guard, not trusting the police. Um, and that distrust for police transfers to other state actors like, like teachers, unfortunately, right? At times, young people who live in these heavily surveilled neighborhoods become detached, they, they become withdrawn. Research shows they have difficulty concentrating in school. Um, and then I say, you know, look, for those of you who practice in the, in the court system, and I often ask when I'm doing trainings of stakeholders in the juvenile legal system, I ask them, have you ever walked into a courthouse and you see a young person sort of sleeping on the bench before their court hearing? And, you know, and, and invariably I get a ton of hands for yes. And I'm always baffled. I'm like, wait, you're here for this very important hearing. How is it that you are asleep? And what is clear over time, I began to realize from this research, it's not only that they're asleep, um, it, it, it falling asleep in the hallway because they didn't sleep the night before just out of sheer anxiety and depression right, about right. this particular court hearing, but also because they have lived with this fear and this anxiety around policing um, and surveillance all of their lives. And so the research shows that children who live again in heavily surveilled neighborhoods mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. who have been the target or have witnessed police um, um, encounters um, also have difficulty Yeah. Me, right again we as adults if you yeah. have a ch child that that child who um didn't sleep the night before has a really hard time not only concentrating but also being calm and respectful uh to teachers and to adults and to yeah. police officers that they might encounter what is so powerful also about this trauma research is that it shows that trauma occurs not only from being the direct target of police aggression, but also from witnessing or hearing about yes. Um, yes. that aggression by family, by friends, or someone who's close to them. So just having to get up in the morning and worry about being the victim of police violence is in and of itself a source of stress. And also watching police brutality on the internet or yes. television involving people they don't even know is again, just as traumatic as being there. Yes, so and it's inescapable. Yeah. Exactly. It's inexcusable, yeah. right? It's inescapable. So, right. Watching George Floyd die yeah. on television. I mean, how many of you were traumatized by that? I was going to say people called me and they're like, oh my God, Chris, have you seen it? Have you seen it? It took me 48 hours to even allow myself because my body was in such knots knowing that I was about to see something horrendous. And then I watched it and just was devastated in tears. Yeah. You, you can't unwatch that. that. You can't, you can't unwatch that. Yes. And so what I invite you to do is not only think about your own trauma, your own secondary trauma that you had in watching it. Now add to that, if you were a black or brown adolescent and you knew that this could happen to you too, it's a whole Listen. different layer of experience. And so, uh, right. I, yes, it's just, um, and then the final thing that I'll say that I think um, really is so important for us to understand, and this goes to the public safety point, for all of you who care about public safety out here, it is this, it is that the research shows that negative encounters with the police, negative observations 
of the police during your adolescent years has a profound impact upon the ways in which children perceive the law and law enforcement as they grow up and as they become adults. So those uh -huh. um, folks who have observed and, and have negative experiences with the police um, really begin to question the fairness and the legitimacy of policing in our country. They begin Absolutely. to re resent um, and fear the police, which has a profound impact on how we navigate safety. Police, uh, young black and brown children don't feel comfortable or safe even calling the police to report victimization, right? And then the final piece of research on the trauma that I wanna share is that the research has shown a link between this trauma, which leads to stress and anxiety, leads to what further, not even further, it leads to delinquency. And I took the word further out yeah. because the yeah. research has shown empirically that even children who were innocent at the time of their first stop and their first frisk have an, um, it increases the risk that they will resort to some delinquent behavior later as a coping mechanism for their um, built up and cumulative trauma and stress. So it has our, our current contemporary policing strategies, right? And again, that's folks in the blue uniform and uh, civilians wow. who police black and brown children. We are actually doing ourselves no favors. The kids are right. in the paper. It's perpetuating that cycle, right. yes. Yes, yes. You know, you, you you mentioned about, you know, a kid in court sleeping because of the trauma. And you know, if they're sleeping in court, they're sleeping in school. In school. Absolutely. So this is why I believe every teacher, every administrator, every school board member, and every parent needs to read this book because it really does open up a, 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 a different perspective than, than what we are um, conditioned to have about adolescent behavior. Um, and so I, you know, we, I'm hoping our, we have some school board members here. We invited members of, of the school board and administration, but we're recording it. And so it will be available as a reference for those who aren't able to be here. So you talked a lot about the fear um, of, of, of policing. And one of the things I've told my son and as, as a black mother or a black parent, we've all had the talk yeah. with our, with our um, children. If they're old enough to walk outside and uh, walk to the bus stop and go to the mall by themselves, we've had to talk about, about policing. And so one of the things I've told my son over and over again, if you're stopped by the police, do not run do not run, don't run. But then, you know, something you said in the book made me question that advice because really, you know, the, the running is, is, is a reflexive response right. to, the, to the trauma and they're terrified. And yeah. so it's almost counterintuitive to not run. Can you talk a little bit more uh, about that? Yeah, such a, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you picked up on that, right? So this flight question is, is such a, 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 a beautiful way to explore the, the, the consequences of fear. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, let me tell you a story and then yeah. I'm going to um, weave out the, the research and what it shows. Yeah. And so one of the stories that I tell in the book is about my client, Tarek. And so Tarek is a teenager who lived in you know, Washington, D.C. in an apartment complex. On one uh, Saturday morning, he, uh, at about 10 a.m., he walked out of his apartment complex to walk next door uh, to visit some relatives in the building right next door. So he walks out of his uh, apartment complex, walks down the walkway, and he gets to a sidewalk. Just as he gets to the sidewalk, he sees uh, a police car with two officers sitting in it, looking at him. Um, and when uh, he sees the officer, he has the slightest break in his step. Like you could tell, he just hesitated for uh -huh. a moment. And the uh -huh. police officers call that a stutter step. 
Um, so, uh, and at that point, they become suspicious because he hesitated in his step. So they literally, he turns the corner, keeps on walking down the, literally just going to the next building. The officers pull up uh, next to him, drive up on the curb, um, and then he takes off running. The officers mm -hmm. jump out, chase him, and his teenage self hides behind a bush, right? Like magical thinking, like they're not going to see him. <laughs> he hides behind the bush, and then they grab him, and they're yelling at him, why are you running? Why are you running? He looks at them, and he says, because you're chasing me. It was such right. a classic <laughs> Classic. classic sort of scenario about what we see with police officers and black and brown youth today. Yeah. Um, and so the question becomes the one that you ask, like, so why are they running? So here's what the police officer said in their police report. They're writing out that this is a stutter step. OK, right. that this right. is a stutter step um, and that the stutter step gave them justification, excuse me, justification to believe that he was committing some, you know, criminal uh, activity. Right. Um, and, and so I really began to do some research around this and you tie it back to that trauma research and you really understand that a black child and a brown child is running, not because they're of consciousness of guilt, but right. because of what, but because of the fear that they have literally grown up with, right? Grown up with either in the yeah. abstract or yeah. in, in real time, they um, are running because of exactly what you said. Black parents have absolutely no choice, really, in today's right. society, but to give the talk. And the talk right. says, you know, to, really, what's so interesting about the talk, let me just say a word about it. The talk says what? It says, you know, put your hands up, stop, don't run, don't flinch, don't do anything that's going to upset the police officers. But what does it do? I mean, and let me be very clear. I am, I am for the talk, but we have to understand that as parents and as adults, that the talk also has another psychological benefit. I mean, a psychological side effect, which side, is that- side effect, yeah. That's right, but is that it, it um, subconsciously reminds young people that police officers are to be feared, right? We right. have a choice, but- Well, to they, are. they, they are. They are to be right. feared. And, I mean, yeah. <laughs> right, right. And then the other thing about the talk is you can tell your child um, that uh, until you are blue uh, in the face <laughs> to stop being an adolescent and to obey me, but what are they going to do? They're still going to be an adolescent. Right. Right? right. So you right. can tell them, you know, don't run. But in the, the heat of the moment, the research the, calls yeah. it hot cognition, in the heat of the moment, a kid does what a kid does. They're impulsive and they're reactive. And don't let their friends run because if their friends run, it's over. It's, a wrap. it's, it's over. One per oh. you just need one person to run, everybody's gonna run. Everybody is gonna run. Everybody <laughs> is gonna run. And yeah. so the point is this is it is that you know, children run at a trauma, not because they're conscious, That's not because right. of consciousness of guilt. And then the final piece that I'll say is also what you just said. It's the fight, flight, or freeze response. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that stutter step, that hesitation in his step, you know, officer doesn't think, think, think twice about it. Oh, that was consciousness of guilt. No, the research shows right, right. disparaging because that's what we've all been trained. So I don't mean to be disparaging in the officer's response to that. But what I'm saying is we all have to do our research. We have to understand how the brain works, right? And that basically right. what happens is that the body senses fear and tenses up. Right. And when the body, the physical body tenses up, everything else shuts down. So all the things that we do and we take for granted, like walking, talking, thinking, right. they, shut right. down for they shut down, they shut down and your body freezes. Yeah. I bet you money. My client Tarek didn't even realize that he right. had like done that, you know, stutter step. All right. Yeah. But that's the fight, flight or freeze response. And what right. we have, it's also the other thing I'll say, I said I was going to say one more thing. I have no, one more thing to say, which is this concept of stereotype threat. Now, that's an academic term. All right. And I do that's one of the few academic terms I use in the book. But then I explain yeah. it. And stereotype threat response is the phenomenon that many black and brown people live with the pervasive fear that they will be labeled or stopped and presumed criminal solely on the basis of their race. 
And the research shows that people who live with that stereotype fear, who have anxiety about that stereotype, um, um, about being stereotyped in that way, act like they're anxious. So they freeze right. up, they, right. you know, they have all these bodily reactions, fidgeting, um, avoiding eye contact, clenching their fists, locking their jaw, all of these things, guess what? In the research shows police training manuals are teaching officers to look for these signs as signs of- As suspicion. reasonable suspicion That's of probable cause. Right. That's when in right. fact, it's a That's physiological right. response to, right. to, to trauma and fear. I mean, <laughs> That's right. it, it's, it, yeah. So, you know, part of the talk that I have with my son is like, look, just go to, let them take you to jail. Let them take you to jail. Even if you did nothing, just go to jail because I can get you out of jail. I can't get you out the morgue. Mm, see? Yes. see? And right. I might tell him, go to jail. Just right. go to jail. I can get you out of jail. I cannot get you out the morgue. That's so just deep. comply. It's deep. It's that's deep. deep. It's deep. I mean, and it's, it's not deep. fair. Like that's it's that's not fair. It's, but it's not, not it's fair. Not but what what am I to do? I'm I'm yeah. trying. You know, it's yeah. it's 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 just yeah. yeah. It's the story of our lives as a black person living in yeah. in this country. I mean, yeah. so the other thing now we were talking about, you know, normal chills. I mean, normal physiological responses to fear and trauma you know, is to fight uh, or flight and freeze and all of that. Add a child with a disability. Let's talk about that. You talk about that in the oh, book yeah. and it really, it hits close to home because um, I have a, a, a child who has ADHD and there's impulsivity um, that goes along with that, a little mouthiness and a little confrontational attitude on top of being a typical adolescent right yeah. but you really beautifully explained um a little bit about um how ch children with with disabilities and how uh, their response to police encounters is is, uh, is, is even more complicated yeah um, can you talk a little bit about that yes and and i must say i learned a lot um, in, in uh, writing this book, um, because I, of course, I mean, I, there's a high percentage of young people in who end up for all the reasons you, you talk about that you've said, and that I'll expand upon, um, who, who end up in the juvenile legal system, who have, you know, some cognitive, emotional, or behavioral disabilities. And so, of course, I've had a number of clients who um, have, you know, challenges, right? And so I had to learn about it. And writing this book was really sort of just eye-opening. And so a couple of things that I learned, and that you, you know, certainly know, but across the country, you know, Black children with disabilities are no are, are not only more likely to um, face uh, discipline within schools, but they're also more likely to be referred to the police. They're more likely to be arrested and more likely to experience some uh, use of force by the police officers. And so there are several factors, you know, that I learned about that, that sort of play into this, right? So that police, one, have very little, first of all, I'm gonna pause and say, police officers across the country have really very little training on adolescent development. Um, and right. the escalation strategies. We could, you know, come back to that later. But even on top of that, they have very little training on trauma, um, on mental health challenges, and on cognitive and emotional uh, or, or learning disabilities, right? So they know very little about or have very little opportunity to practice and get skilled in working with young people who have depression, autism, attention um, deficit, hyperactivity disorders, speech and language disorders is yes. a significant one in encounters with police. You talked about mouthy and the like. Yes. Um, and so um, it's really important when we talk, for example, about autistic children to yes. recognize that autistic children um, often have poor executive functioning, meaning pro um, they have difficulty with problem solving, uh, reasoning, uh, working memory, task management skills. So why do I say all of that? Because they have a hard time with police officers and with other adult authority figures um, uh, handling the 
who, what, where, when kinds of questions, right? right, um, right. So they have difficulty understanding, processing, and responding to these WH questions, right? And yeah. so when they attempt to answer an officer's question, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Who are you with? Why are you here? Often in very rapid fire questions, they have a really hard time answering those and end up appearing to be suspicious or like they're hiding something, right? So they might stutter, they might talk fast, they might what they call clutter their words or jump from topic to topic when they get upset. Um, right. And so, and I, I wanna be really clear, I didn't know or understand any of this before I started writing this book. And I had a client who, uh, you know, not to tell any more stories, so I won't, but I had a client who we were watching police body worn camera and it was just so just rapid and like it went from zero to a hundred and I just didn't understand why. And I met with a, uh, a, um, a speech and language expert and she helped me understand. And that's how I learned a lot uh, about this, right? Um, right? Also, you know, children with autism also um, and, and other, you know, sort of emotional and cognitive uh, uh, challenges have sensory deficit disorders, meaning that loud noises and police yeah. lights and buzzing sounds and yeah. even physical touch by a stranger is very traumatic. Yeah. Um, in fact, the client that really opened my eyes to all of this was a client um, who was autistic and he was at the metro station and an officer walked up to him uh, because he was jumping the turnstile. Again, very adolescent, you know, uh, right. behavior, but he was jumping the turnstile, meaning he was entering without paying. And an officer walked up to him and he immediately knew he was in the wrong. He's like, I'm right. I'm sorry. Put his head down, put his shoulder down. I'm sorry. Right. And the officer was talking to him very kindly and everything seemed to be fine. All of a sudden, a second officer comes from out of nowhere and grabs oh. uh, my client by the shoulder and it was over. I mean, it went from zero to a hundred in a second because he touched him. That's right. it. And so not understanding that, you know, we've got to use strategies. Talk, I mean, and even, you know, truth be told, even if he weren't autistic, there was, you know, no reason to touch him. Like just right, right. Him right? Give him a warning, you know, tell him you can't, you know, jump the turnstile, right? And so, I mean, different people have different responses, um, different ideas about what is an appropriate consequence for a child who is trying to enter the metro or the, the, the subway without paying. And here's my thing. Again, I want to ask you, would you, um, you know, lock up a white child who was entering, you know, without paying? And we have to think right. about differential responses. So, you know, I, 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 well, I, I do want to say one more thing. I was going to say, I'll stop there. They that, which ties into my last point, which is the yeah. notion of implicit bias. So not only, right, do you have children with disabilities or um, who, uh, you know, autistic children who have these, um, uh, you know, issues with who, what, where, when, or, uh -huh. or, or other things, but if they're black and brown children, you're going to layer implicit racial bias on that. On and so if, if they, right, so if they already appear to be acting erratic, right, to a police officer because of some uh, cognitive limitation or some cognitive challenge, um, and they're Black, people don't, the, the, your default isn't to say, oh, he must be, uh, there must be a mental health challenge here, or there must be a cognitive challenge. The default is he's a threat and he's a danger. Right, so the right. combination of disability and implicit bias is, you know, takes us off the charts. Yeah, it, it, it's combustible. So, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room or the elephant in Virginia <laughs> is uh, cops in schools. So Arlington County uh, uh, in, in, in APS, uh, our school board, um, after a, a study that was done with a, a task force voted to remove school resource officers in schools. Um, a, our new governor has vowed to have a, uh, at least one police officer in every school. And so our community is very divided on uh, this, whether it's safe to have officers in, in school or not. But uh, as you pointed out in your book, at Columbine had two school resource officers. Right. That didn't stop the shooting, right? Parkland had at least one uh, school resource officer and that, uh, that didn't uh, stop the shooting. But without debating that too much, can you um, 
for our audience, talk a little bit about the history of police in schools, how we got to this point, and really, was it really about safety? So um, yet another thing that I learned from this, from writing the book, I will say that I um, really bought into the often repeated narrative that we have police in schools and as many, um, that we have police in schools uh, because teachers and parents were afraid to send their school, their children to school after uh, the mass shooting in Columbine and that series of shootings, that school shootings that occurred in the 1990s. Um, uh, but when I dug back, right, and looked at the history, which I had not uh, quite paid attention to, what I um, learned and uh, I found was that uh, the first police officers in schools actually appeared in 1939 in Indianapolis um, in tandem with the earliest conversations or speculations about um, school integration. So that's back in 1939. And then we saw that in the, the civil rights era, on the heels of Brown versus Board of Education, we saw a, an exponential increase of police officers in schools to do what, right? Both uh, for and against the, they were purportedly sent to the schools to facilitate uh, integration uh, racial integration. And we know, even from the iconic photographs, that so often officers ended up being an impediment um, to those integration efforts, right? So right. we actually have a proliferation of police in schools in the, in, in the 1960s. And then um, what is so powerful um, is that by 1991, and this is important because Columbine was in 1999. So eight years before Columbine, we have um, the National Association of School Resource Officers is founded. So there's oh, enough Nazareth. officers, yes, Nazaro, enough um, officers, enough of a training curriculum, enough of a presence, enough of a political voice to have their own association. That's eight years before Columbine. And then what happens between 1991 and 1999 is that you have a temporary uptick in crime, right? And we have the super predator myth is mm -hmm. introduced, right? Yep. That is directly and explicitly naming, um, uh, 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 targeting Black children as the purported um, uh, 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 perpetrators of this increase in crime. And mind you, this is a temporary uptick in crime and that the super predator myth ended up being inaccurate a falsehood, right? Just um, a pseudo-scientific theory that never bore out. But by 1999, um, which by the time we have Columbine, um, we, uh, the, the federal government has already set up the Cops and Schools program. People don't know that. It's allocated. Now, I not knew that. Yes, right? Uh, but not, you know, you know there was you know, some questions about how much it was gonna be funded, but the cops in schools um, uh, 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 framework, federal government framework was already in place. In 1999, it was then that uh, uh, federal government began to increase dollars into that, yes. that pool. Yes. But it's important to know, I believe it was a 1994 crime bill, but some of those- It's a 1994 crime That's control right. and, law, and law enforcement act. Yep. That's right. That created cops and schools. And so I say all of that to say that the narrative, right, that has been driving so much of the conversation today um, um, is, is, is mass school shootings and the fear of schools. It is not what, you know, how we got to the proliferation of, of police officers. And I think it's really important um, for us to understand that history. And so I'm glad, you know, you asked me to sort of to, to, to share that, that there has always been a racial component. And let, this is the Absolutely. most important to, to really underscore that point. So when the federal government began to pour more and more money into the cops and schools program, where did police officers get sent? They got sent to schools um, with a predominantly African-American and Latin, uh, Latinx uh, population. Um, and where was Columbine and Sandy Hook and all those mass shootings? Thank you. Right, urban and, and this little kid out in Michigan whose, whose parents knew he bought him a gun for Christmas. Let's, let's not even, that's, 
So I have a little confession. Yes. So my first job out of law school was working for the cops office. Oh, was it? Oh, wow. Yes. Really? I, I, in, in the legal division, monitoring those grants uh, to police departments, I went all across the country training police departments on how yeah. to appropriately spend these grant funds yes. for cops in school, yes. equipment, and other things. I have done a whole 180 since then. Um, yeah. So, but the, 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 the narrative, right, at the time was, A, you know, we do have some gang problems and, 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 and some violent crimes in, in some of these schools. And so, you know, we need to just officers there for safety. But secondly, for community policing, we want to build relationships That's right. with, between officers and students and we put them in there to mentor and it sounded good it sounded noble i was i was high you were going on, in. On, on president clinton at the time and proud yes. to be working in that program now i am a mother <laughs> and i've done a whole 180 on that but let's talk a little bit about mentoring because that's a myth and that is one of the things that oh, right. we, we, we talk a lot about in Arlington for the people who want the administrators and the teachers who want police officers in school to say they're here to mentor kids. But there is an issue with 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 um, the Fifth Amendment and incrimination yeah. and, and mentoring. Can you talk about that conflict? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. Most people like don't, um, there's such a nuance in the book. Um, but so when I began to research uh, the like NASRO and uh, school police officers, school resource officers, you know, and I just have to say, you know, Simone, you are like, you are that person, right? Like you bought and in. That like, the, I, I mean, that's, and I don't, I mean, I get it. I get where we come from. So here's what I learned. And, and this is still on the books and Nazaro stands by this. Um, and I understand it, but they're, they're missing a critical point that Nazaro's definition of what uh, the role of a, a police officer in school is a three-part role one part officer, one part counselor, and one part teacher. So they had envisioned, and they still envision that, the, you know, an officer, it's officer friendly, who, like you said, is going to mentor and counsel and advise and maybe even do some career counseling for young people and, you know, improve youth police relations um, by being officer friendly at school. And they would even be part teacher because maybe there was some class that they can teach on, you know, social studies or civics or some classes that they have in mind and then part police officer. So here's the problem. And, you know, it's not just me in my opinion. There's some research backing yeah. that up. It is that officers are confused themselves. That's number one. Officers right. are confused about their role. So they get sent to police, uh, they get sent to schools. There are right. not adequate MOUs, memorandum of understanding, spelling out the roles of the various, uh, of the, of the, um, uh, uh, their various roles. Um, and so, and also they aren't trained. They aren't trained, not only are they not trained in adolescent development, but they're not right. trained in counseling, in mental health advising. Um, you know, they don't have a teacher's license to be teachers. And so this, again, is not meant to be disparaging of police officers at all, is that you're asking them to do something that they're not trained to do. So they're confused, number one, about their roles, because there's lack right. of clarity. They haven't right. been trained. And so here's what happens as the default, and officers will tell you this themselves, you default to what you learned in police academy, right? So you default to being a police officer, not the counselor and not the, the, the teacher. And so what right. do police officers do? They act like police officers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That means every, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So that means you're going to arrest you're going to stop, you're gonna frisk, you're gonna intervene um, to get kids to calm down in the hallway. I'm sorry, I don't want you to intervene and get the kids to calm down in the hallway. Let, you know, behavioral specialists do that or, or somebody else do that, not police officers. So that's one whole component of the problem. A second whole component of this three-part structure or three-part responsibility is everything that we already talked about earlier, which is the trauma. Okay, uh -huh. so uh -huh. it, 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 people cannot understand, and I really, I just beg people to really understand the nuances um, that 
you, you people are weighing this question about whether uh, we are safer by having police in schools. We have to remember that police presence is not without tremendous cost to the children, um, the psychological trauma and the fallout from that. And remember, one of the things that I said was a fallout was that it, the trauma, the anxiety, the stress increases crime and not reduces crime. So you have to account for that. You have to account for the fact that black and brown children actually don't feel safer when they have police. That's right. School. So you've got all of these complicated, so it's not doing what we hope that it's going to do. A third piece is what you, you alluded to, the due process question. This one is really complicated. People don't love this, um, but this is- this I get it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's, a, it's a real, it's another nuance. It is the ways in which um, uh, having officers play multiple roles. The, the idea of them being the police officer, who's what their job is to investigate, interrogate, to arrest. And that's then, the sworn oath. That that's the have. sworn oath, right? It's a requirement. Then, yep, exactly. And then on the other hand, you want them to be counselors and mentor. So to get friendly and buddy buddy with the kid, right? Um, and you want them to be teacher. Well, if schools are a safe space, if teachers are a safe space, if mentors are a safe space, then you've got kids who are, are just as confused as the police officers about what the role is of an officer, right? So wait, are you my mentor or are you interrogating me? Or are you, and so there have been some studies um, and, and focus groups with young people who are very confused in some schools, okay, right? We're not talking about, you know, you know schools, you know, where there's officer friendly. I'm talking about, you know, largely about about urban communities where officers are there to police, okay? Right. And, and it's very confusing for children um, and it compromises in some important ways that I hope some of you, you know, really think are important, right? We, we as a country believe in due process and, um, and that everyone is, is, you know, presumed innocent and um, has a, a liberty yeah. interest in being free um, from undue police intrusion and interrogation. And that, that gets compromised when you compromise the roles of police officers Absolutely. in these kinds of settings. So it's complicated. Yeah. So you guys, if you want it mentors, is complicated. It is complicated. If you want yes. mentors for kids, hire mentors for kids. This That's is right. not to say that a police officer can never be a mentor, but they certainly can't, you know, this is my view, uh, be a mentor. Uh, um, when, when, they're they're on on duty, duty, when they're on duty, when they're on duty in uniform. I, yes. That's what I think it's complicated, unless they are a mentor, like a career mentor or a vocational mentor to right. somebody who wants to do this as a career. Or on their free time. It's, right. it's different. But to me, it blurs the lines against self-incrimination if, 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 if a student is confiding and, and, and what have you. So we are running short on time. Yeah. I could be with you all day. I mean, there's so much here, um, so many questions. I'm going to ask one more question and then go to the chat for a, a, a few. We, we can't get to, there's 99 messages in the chat. <laughs> we can't get to all of them, right, but right. this has been phenomenal. Um, um, on the title, so how America polices black children, we get. Yeah. What does the rage of innocence mean exactly? Yeah, so um, the rage of innocence is the rage that every single one of us should have anytime any one child is deprived of an opportunity to be a child. And I, I mean, I just, I really believe that with all of my um, heart and passion that we have to let children be children. But beyond that, there are some nuances. And I think the most important nuance to that title, it is also the rage that uh, any human being, any person that has an ounce of dignity and self-worth, it is the rage that they have when they are repeatedly told over and over again that they're criminal, that they're violent, that they should be excluded, that they um, aren't worthy. And so it is the rage that black and brown children have when they are constantly um, told or are given these labels of criminal. And I say to folks, you all, um, a healthy adolescent uh, should speak up, right? Um, and resist those labels 
and resist that dehumanization and that criminalization that we're talking about. And so sometimes when you see an adolescent, right, in that adolescent aggressive speech and speaking out and resisting, um, uh, it is critical um, to remember that that's a sign of dignity, self-worth, and humanity that they're standing up for. So um, I just think that's such an important uh, uh, point. It is. I've, I've talked to other, you know, parents about we, we feel rage. Right. <laughs> what's ha happening with our kids, and and we feel like their innocence is has, is 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 taken away prematurely just because they're black, and you know they don't get the benefit of the doubt. So I'm gonna check the chat just to see. Uh, Hey, if Simone, there's any questions I haven't hey, answered. Yes. Hey, Go hey, ahead, Simone, Therese. Therese. I've been filtering the direct questions into your DMs. I'm looking. I don't see anything from you in my DM. Nothing at all? No. I was just You looking. may need to scroll up, look for a red mark that says direct message. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let me scroll up just to see. I'm at the top. Okay. I'm scrolling down now. Okay, from Ron Haddock, Haddock. From your book introduction, you cited the problem is also in areas where the black adults are in control. Could you explain how and why? Quote, it is a city where many, if not most of the decision makers controlling the juvenile and criminal legal system are black, judges, bailiffs, probation officers, the city's attorney general, city council members, and a mayor. We have many of the black police chief and many police officers who are black. Uh, it, he goes on, but yeah. just in brevity. Yeah, I, it, look, um, I live in Washington, DC, exact same, right? You know, look, uh, all the many of the lead actors in our system are African-American and yet we still have these disparities. Yes. And you know, the research talks about the ways in which implicit bias works, especially uh -huh. with regard to the stereotype of criminality and the stereotypical link, presumptive link between uh, blackness and criminality is so incredibly strong that yeah. it affects all of us, even people of color. So that's one piece is that the implicit bias, we don't even realize and a black officer doesn't even realize on the street, right? That they are perceiving that adolescent conduct or that uh, that uh, a, a child with a disability um, as, as from a biased lens, they, they're not even aware of it. They think this is, a threat. Whereas if you saw a white child, um, you would think, oh, that's a white child who is, um, you know, having a temper tantrum. But you notice the word child is still in there, right? And right. so that's the dehumanization piece is really critical. Another piece, another example of that implicit racial bias is I, I imagine many of you on the Zoom um, know about the research by Dr. Philip Atiba Goff on the adultification of, of black children. Um, and really yeah. it's, about the, it's about the ways in which our implicit biases cause all of us, um, or many of us, I should say, uh, to perceive black children to be about four and a half years or more older than they actually are. All right. Yes. So yes. that has a profound impact on how you interpret their behaviors, um, how, whether you decide to stop them, um, whatever it is, um, that's important. Implicit bias shows that we are more likely to believe that black uh, folks are stronger, bigger, heavier uh -huh. than they actually are. There is implicit bias um, showing that um, uh, stopping uh, or seeing a, a group of black youth in a group um, yes. that uh, people are more likely to perceive them as dangerous than seeing white uh, youth in a group. So that's one whole, I, I probably went on too long, but the point being no, implicit fine. bias yeah. affects black folks and white folks. Um, Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I, I think the other thing is that we um, also as black folks, we live in a country that has absolutely bought into the narrative, the false narrative that the only way and the best way to um, 
uh, the only way and the best way to keep our society safe is through law enforcement, traditional law enforcement. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That is that is just that's an American phenom, right? Like, right. and you know, it's 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 not true. There are countries, um, other countries that have less crime and less law enforcement, right? Right. Uh, right. Without law enforcement, I should put it to you that way. Yeah. Uh, but there are other ways. So I'll stop so we can get in more. So yeah, that implicit bias is really so ingrained. Um, and, and, and black people aren't exempt from it because we see here in, in, in APS that many of the schools with black administrators have a very high rate of referrals to law enforcement, where right. many of those administrators are sending our kids to the police. Um, can I and say, so, yeah, yes. so I think part of that also it's, is, and I know a lot of want to know, you know, so what's the, the alternative, right? So, uh, so a part of why we default, <clears throat> excuse me, to sending our children to the courts is because we haven't been provided with adequate resources for alternatives, right? So that means wow. not enough you know, mental health uh, counselors on site in school. You can pay to put a police right. officers in school, right. but where are the, the the flurry of social workers, mental health providers, um, tutors, um, funding for extra teachers so we can have smaller sizes, so that smaller class sizes, so there's less distraction and less conflict within a room. Um, right. Where are where is funding for um, if you actually attend a school with real violence? Where right. is the funding for violence interrupters, incredible messengers um, right. that have been you know shown to work? Where is the funding for adequate? social emotional learning and let me say this Very about awesome. all of those programs people say well we try those we try those what what often what you see is that they um try them but they try them without adequate funding um and without an opportunity for trial and error without opportunity for meaningful investment and um following uh the model um, in the ways in which it was intended. And so you have uh, introduction of restorative justice, which I am in favor of. So restorative right. justice programs, which you have in Arlington, right? And let's well, say, you know- Not in our schools. It's not, not in, in our schools. It's ah. supposed to be coming, but it's not being accelerated at the rate we would like to see it. Well, so, and it's a mindset. Do. Restorative practices is a mindset. Absolutely, it's not and a it program. And it takes years, exactly. that's right. It's not that's, a program and it takes right. a while and it's just, it can't come fast enough. Exactly, and we have to be willing to invest that. If we were willing to throw all those dollars into law enforcement, if we would just throw all yeah. those dollars into in, into frameworks, right, mindsets yeah. and programs, right, and staff, mental health staff, providers, and counselors that are proven to work, um, we would be so much better off. But we haven't really, um, uh, you know, we just we 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 just haven't been able. Yeah, to. we're we're behind. And I, I, uh, I saw Sharon Saintil on, on the call earlier. I don't know if she's still on, but she is our um, new hire in APS for student climate and culture. And one of her, I think, responsibilities is to help implement restorative practices. So I am so grateful that she saw it uh, uh, fit and appropriate and to, to, to spend her extra time what she's not getting paid for to tune into this program so yeah I'm and i see other about that. i see um if i scroll through i see kamiko lightly who i know has done you know yes kamiko yes yeah, restorative justice work and introducing uh, restorative justice in schools. So, you know, definitely. I think we're further along in our juvenile maybe or in the criminal system than we are in our schools. So and, and so, maybe yeah. we can get in the chat. Folks um, who are doing restorative justice can talk about what's happening in the schools, so all of us can be educated. That's great. Yes, that would be great. So there's another question. There's a question from Carol Lieber. Um, does Professor Henning think having a more diverse and integrated school system would help the way children of different races are treated, or maybe the workforce is what needs to be more diversified? So, so wait, is it the question whether the workforce or the students or which, which is the question or, or the- Well, she, I think she wants to know if we had better integrated schools, our schools here are still 
pretty I much see. segregated, right? We, we, we have been desegregated by court order, but we're not truly in Got it. Absolutely. So there are a couple of things, and, and I, I want to be careful because I want to make sure I don't get the research wrong. I don't cite this, this research in the book. There is um, considerable research. So, right, you have to weigh the, the, you know, the benefits of integration, um, uh, integrated school systems with some of the trade-offs. Um, so let me be clear. I'll, I'll say this. This is the safest thing to say, that there are tremendous value to integrated schools in terms of resources, um, uh, attitude, mindset. However, research also shows though that integration isn't the end all and be all because schools that have um, higher percentage of white students and low percentage of black students, those black students have extraordinary, there's extraordinary racial disparities, even higher rates of racial disparities in um, arrest and referral to police. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that in other yeah. words, if you put black kids in with a, and I'm not saying an even balance, right? But schools uh -huh. that are predominantly white and you've got a handful or a smaller number of black and brown children, those kids have really high, high risk of, of an increase in arrest and referrals because of that implicit bias, right? Mm -hmm. So the question really becomes, can we do integration in a, in a way that creates um, uh, you know, an even without, you know, it's always that tipping point, right? Um, yeah. that, that's at play. The other question that I thought I heard was the, 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 the workforce, the staff and the like, and here's the yeah. deal, right? We already talked about that. We know that even our black and brown teachers and administrators are, are, are making some of the referrals and calling the police on our kids. So it's more than that. I do yeah. think, you know, uh, diversity of the workforce, but it's also, it's a radical culture shift. It is a radical, radical culture shift. It is an owning of the fact that we all have implicit racial biases, biases, that's important. It is um, a, a requirement that everyone, like we all, you know, as teachers, you think you learn adolescent development. What I'm saying, we've got to learn adolescent development and criminality or what we are labeling as criminal. Right, we understand right. that so much of what we label as criminal is, is, is what we call normal adolescent behaviors for That's which right. white parents would redirect their children by sending them to an advanced science class, <laughs> right? You would never you know, arrest them, um, call a police officer on them because they you know, talk back to you. It's just, it's not, it's just, it's, it's just isn't the norm. Yeah. <laughs> but right. we've accepted it as the norm. We have, well, you know, we've, this goes all the way back for, 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 for Black folks, way back to, 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 to slavery. Mm. So Peter Hannick um, asked about a program at Georgetown. He says, apparently Georgetown University has created some kind of institute to begin breaking down barriers between the police, the police and, the, yes. and the community. Can you cool. tell us a little bit about how that program is doing and, and what are you thoughts? Yeah. So actually, so I, you know, fortunately, I, I know a little bit about it because I was one of the faculty who um, has been sort of a faculty advisor to that program. So it was originally called the Innovations and in Policing uh, Project, okay. which has uh, since uh, changed its name, but that's the, the way folks most know it because the name change was so recent. And, and exactly the idea was to um, bring together you know, from a research lens, let's start there, but bring together thought leaders, and that includes police officers themselves, who were innovative and thoughtful um, about all of these questions, and not just the race question, which is obviously at the forefront, but the race question, the, the policing of homelessness, right? So we think about policing of homeless youth, policing around disabilities, having, you know, experts come in and talk to our officers about uh, disabilities, um, mental health, you know, you know, having uh, a police officer arriving on the scene in the midst of a middle of someone else's mental health crisis. Um, so, so we, we had sessions on um, uh, police officers and uh, working with adolescents, right? And, uh -huh. and the like. And so part of that is about bringing together thought leaders to understand what are best practices. A part of it is then educating. And we launched a um, Police for Tomorrow's fellowship program, which is now, I believe, in its fourth cohort um, since we began. And it was a small cohort of about 
uh, I want to, I think our number is like 25, varies a little bit each year, where officers from the Metropolitan Police Department partner up with us and go through a year, I'm sorry, a, uh, yeah, a year long um, curriculum um, whereby they hear from speakers and um, the like. And it's everything from touring the African American Museum and understanding what we've been talking about, some of this history of policing. We have done in the, the uh, 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 Police for Tomorrow's Fellowship Program, we've had youth police dialogues where we brought in um, children, uh, both middle school and high school into uh, various places. We've done some of them at Georgetown, some of them in the community. We've taken police officers out to the jail um, and had sessions out there. So there's so many components of it, but yes, that's the, uh, that's the idea behind that program. And I should say, yeah. you know, we started that with um, just a little bit of, of, of seed money. I mean, like really little bit. Um, now, I mean, to, in order to replicate that, you've got to, you know, do fundraising, make that bigger. But I always like to say that is that, you know, you just take an idea, group of faculty members, you know, I was at Christy Lopez and Rosa Brooks together, the two of them came uh -huh. up with the idea and then brought in three more faculty members. We just sat around and talked about, hey, you know, what could we do? Um, right. That's, that's how it got started. That is fantastic. I know you're doing a, um, some training with some uh, departments here in Arlington, which I think is fantastic. You work with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, the Public mm -hmm. Defenders, you said DHS. Department, well. Department of Human Services. The yeah. Department of yeah, Human that's Services. That's yeah. yeah, so I invited our police chief and our deputy chief for community engagement, I don't see them in the participants list, but <laughs> you know, I would love it if uh, they would be open to having you train them. I think our officers need training. Um, so we'll see what uh, we can do on, on an advocacy, uh, from yeah. an advocacy standpoint for that because they really should be open to 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 having this kind of training because that's yeah. really and, and, and somebody put in the chat I saw that and there's so many you know pieces coming through was that you know training is not enough and I say that all the time right yeah. so absolutely training unequivocally right um, just awareness raising but then in addition to that there's got to be you know regulations and accountability and a commitment to what I say is radically reducing the footprint of police officers in the lives yeah. of all children and yeah. especially black and brown children who have been so disproportionately um, targeted. So, yeah. yeah. So I wanna be respectful of your time. I could be here all night. Um, there, there are a lot of questions that you know we didn't get to, but one thought that Adrian Fikes has, has brought up, which is a good point, is that how do we get the adults who are you know, perpetuating this behavior, how do we hold them accountable instead of having our children having to adapt to the maladaptive behavior. Absolutely. That's what a beautiful question. And hello. $1 million dollar question. Yeah. No, it is though. But I think it's it's partly about, um, you know, this is what I say. Uh, you know, people say I have almost too, mu too much grace on this point is that we, um, we can't hold the adults accountable until we educate them. So number one, we've got to get out there and make sure people understand, understand the, yeah. how harmful the strategy Because look at you, Simone, right? You're, you know, you're good, you know, child loving person and you believe that cops in schools was uh, the good way to go. So we've got to one, educate, right? And then set regulations, set appropriate um, uh, memoranda of understanding and then training and accountability, right? So it's a comprehensive yeah. set yeah. of, of um of, of procedures and that includes teachers, right? So you've got yeah. to educate them and tell them, look, you can't call the police for X, Y, Z, and Z right. That out, right? And explain why it's not just, I'm giving you regulations to put you in jeopardy or make it harder for you to teach your class, but this is why, okay? And then and from a, a meaningful alternative of who else to call. And then right. without call, and then when they violate that rule, it makes sense to hold people accountable, right? Absolutely. So above, yeah. And from a personal responsibility standpoint, we have to be willing to evolve yes. in our thinking. When we learn more, we should do better, right? When we know better, we should do better and, and be willing to, 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 to evolve in our, in our thinking. Yep. And so, um, so I just- So, um, so we are at 8.07. Yeah. Um, so, 
there are people still in the room. So I am, I am just assuming that there are people still engaged. So one more question and then we can do our final announcements and wrap up. Is, is that okay with you, uh, Professor Hayden? Oh, it's fine with me. I'm okay. <laughs> it's okay. 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 <laughs> people are gonna okay, hate so us. They're like, what? <laughs> I showed I know, up at an evening event and I'm here. <laughs> they don't want to leave, but you know, it's I, I get it. I like I said, we need we need a half a day with you. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. There is so much here. Everyone needs to go out and buy the book. The link, did you put the link to? Um, yes, we have the posted that we posted the okay. link several times. So um, hopefully people have been able to um, save that so that they can purchase ah, the book later. Sharon Saintil did ask, is there training available for officers on cultural competency and executive functioning? Oh, that's have great. you done that with any, with the, with any uh, department? So I've done, I would say the co cultural competent piece. And then, you know, from my understanding that I'm a lawyer, I have educated um, officers in the same way we just talked about the, the autism and the like, but I want to be careful that because I am not a speech and language um, expert or developmental expert, I often partner with developmental experts and doing a training like that, right? So, but the answer is, is yes. Um, I certainly have done what I call adolescent race equity trainings and workshops with officers. And as a part of that, it is making sure that we don't mistake, right? Um, uh, right? Uh, uh, those kinds of responses that are a part of, or a, a function of a disability, they don't, we don't mistake them as a threat and danger. Yeah. And I know, I mean, we, 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 we have met extensively with members of our, our police department here and they don't get enough training right. on, on, on students with disabilities or, you know, restraint and seclusion or, or adolescent uh, behavior. It's, it's, it's a deficit in, yeah. the, in their training protocol. So maybe we could advocate for, for that. Absolutely. And yeah, reach out to me. So like, you know, in terms of thinking about somebody who could be you know, a good trainer in that. I certainly would be happy to come and do some of that myself, but partnering, I have, uh, you know, other ideas and names of folks who might be able. That, to that's great. We'll follow up with you um, about that. So, you know, we, we, we wanted this session to be educational and um, also have some action. So we have a call to action and I'm gonna let my uh, colleague, Cherie, uh, take that away. So um, Leah, do you, you have a link for the call to action, right? So um, what, we, what we like to do is we don't like to just have these conversations. We want these conversations to create action, to create movement forward. So we have had a, a takeaway um, created that gives some ideas for things that you can do um, if you're interested in learning more, if you're interested in getting more engaged in the community. Um, we have it right, it's right here on the screen. Um, I will not belabor it, but if when we send out the recording, and I'm gonna ask my technical person this before I commit, Leah, will we be able to include this when we send out the report, the recording as well? I just put the link in the chat. Yes, of course, yes. The link and is in the chat as well. People can look at it now and we'll send it out. Okay, yes, and I, so I wanna give credit to this to, um, uh, Sam, um, Sam our, scales are wonderful. Sam intern. Scales are, um, he's interning with the NAACP and he is a fourth year law student at the university of Baltimore school of law. And so he, uh, created this for us. So I don't know if he's, I think he's in class tonight. <laughs> so thank you to Sam, but I wanted to make sure that he got, um, his just uh, recognition. Right, and the final thing that we'd like to, uh, if you can hang on for 10 seconds, we have written a letter, as, as many of you know, here in Arlington, we have a, uh, an endorsement caucus that uh, helps to select the candidate for school board here in Arlington. Um, the kink in that is that um, the school board candidacy is nonpartisan. So we have spent, you know, a significant amount of time um, considering this position, this issue, and we've come up with a position. And as part of that position, we are doing a call to action and asking people to reach out to the Arlington County Democratic Committee and express 
your um, your feelings, your ideas about this. The call to action is in the um, in the chat. Uh, we believe that this particular activity undertaken by ACDC um, limits voter activity and also centers power within a very small group of um, of, of white people. And um, they are in the process, ACDC has finally decided that they are going to consider this issue. But we understand that maybe this whole process of them considering it may be largely performative. And we want to push them to do an honest look at this process and, and the impacts that it has on voting in the community. So again, that's linked in the chat. Um, Please, you know, be active. We want we want this to be movement. We don't want to just have intellectual conversations. We want to spark action and inspire you. Um, and if there is nothing else, JD, do you want to send us off? Are you still here? He's been throwing he's been throwing links in the chats for us all night. Backstop, President. Yeah, and I'll let him send us off. And well, before he does that, um, Doctor, I'm sorry, Professor Henning. Do you have any uh, final thoughts for us or uh, anything you'd like to, to close with? No, I would, you know, I, everybody says no, then they say something, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that. Right, it's just a habit. So, you know, truly the thing is, you know, we as a country have to commit ourselves to treating all children like children, and that includes black and brown children. And I should not have to add that to that sentence, but that's right. our takeaway, <clears throat> excuse me, from today's um, discussion. So thank you all. I'm so happy that you all, um, you know, came out in such numbers to, to listen to this conversation and engage. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. President Spain, are you able to close yeah, us out? Yeah, Liz, you took care of me. Uh, Professor Henning, thank you for spending time with our branch and our, our phenomenal leaders, both uh, Simone and Cherie, uh, who's been doing yeoman's work over the years. Uh, again, I won't belay the time in an hour, but thank you so much for being with us. And we look forward to working with you in the uh, near future. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you so much. We'll follow up with you for some training resources. Um, right. All most right. Definitely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everyone. All right. Wonderful, wonderful night. Have a good night. Thanks. You too.